Okay, we finished talking about our featureization techniques based off of composition and off of structure. Now in this video, we're gonna talk about crystal structure graphs, right? Now, why graphs? Well, graphs turn out to be a really convenient and powerful way to represent lots of different types of information. I mean, just think of the things outside of material science for a moment all around us, maybe email messages, right? In the world of email, you have email users and you have messages. The messages get passed back and forth between users. And so you can immediately picture in your mind a picture sort of like what I've got here where you have nodes, like these, these would be the users, and then you have connections between users and these would be the edges, right? These would be the messages. Um, and that's for email, right? Uh, but there's lots of other things. Imagine just relationships, the friendships that you have. You have friends at work, you have friends in your family, you have friends through your you know, communities. Um, and these don't necessarily interact and some people might be connected through multiple different channels, right? And so people and their relationships are another good one for nodes and edges. Or think of papers. In the academic world, we have papers, right, that we read. And then there's citations. When you follow somebody else's work and you build upon it, you're citing them. So the nodes could be the papers. The edges could now be the citations. It's this really flexible framework for all sorts of things. Uh, and material science is no different because obviously what we have in material science are molecules and materials. And these are made up of atoms and atoms are bonded to one another. So there's a very natural, easy way to say, oh, the nodes will be the atoms and the edges of our graphs will be the bonds, right? So, um, and this obviously has, uh, it's really powerful for organic molecules as well. Um, we'll be doing a video after this uh, in just a moment on how we can apply these string representations to organic molecules. But again, think of this sort of drawing that you probably saw something like this in OCHEM. How do you represent that for a, a machine learning model? One way to do it would be to turn this into a string-based representation. It's recognizing that this is a graph of connected things, and so they put together the string of letters in such a way that you're, you're highlighting what things are connected to what in this graph network. Another way to do it would be to turn it into an adjacency matrix-based representation. So again, you've got all these different elements in here. You've got a carbon, an oxygen, a carbon, um, another oxygen, carbon, carbon, like on down it goes. Then you could say, of all these things, how are they connected to everything else, right? Are they connected by a single bond or double bonds? You can see that the twos represent double bonds, whereas ones represent single bonds. And zeros mean that those things are not connected, right? So this is a way of representing the connectivity of the different elements in this molecule, right? Now, the, the SMILES approach, this string-based approach called SMILES, um, that goes back to the 80s, an early paper in the 80s, and it's been used for a long time. But it's not like the end-all be-all. It has some problems. In fact, the same molecule, this one up here, for example, could have the exact same molecule, could have multiple different smile strings that refer to the same one because you have some options on when you get to these loops. Where do you start and end the loop? And there's some, there's some ambiguity, right? And so there's been some improvements over the years. There's deep smiles. And then more recently, a couple years ago, selfies. Um, to my knowledge, selfies is actually really quite good now, and it's probably what we should be using. But still, you'll find that many... Uh, packages and representation tools out there still use smiles, okay? But these are all taking advantage of the graph network mentality, right? That we're saying these molecules are graphs. They're connected in certain ways. Let's represent them as such so that we can then do our ML models on top of that, okay? Now, in a future uh, video, later this semester, we're going to do some case studies on all of these because here's some of the powerful tools that are out today. And my gosh, every couple months, a new one crops up and it's not surprising. Um, but there's some really great ones, and they are very good at predicting materials properties, at predicting structure, at doing some really great things. So we will do detailed dives on some of these and sort of see what's under the hood and how are they different and how are they similar to one another a little bit later. But in this video, I do want to talk about the introduction of the concept and some general concepts of how they work, right? So, you know, I, this, I put this video together because a while back my students wanted to make our, our own graph network approach to this. And when they were describing it to me, this was my thought. I was like, seriously? There are so many of these things at this point, and they're all great. And we're going to introduce something that is also great, and it's not going to be all that different. Like, why do we really need new ones? Is there new work to be done here? Um, and that'll be the subject for a future video, but I will at least say that here's some of the points where you might want to consider. First off, the current sort of fleet of graph neural networks. Again, more on neural networks and more on the details later, but they are too connected, too slow, and too large. What do I mean by those things? What do I mean by a, a graph network that's too connected, right? Well, let's dive into it a little bit. How do they actually form their network of whatever it is that they're doing, right? If you have a crystal structure, 
and you start here, the typical way that they identify edges between nodes is by starting with some position in the lattice, and then they start looking outwards. Maybe if you've ever used the, the crystal uh, software Vesta for drawing crystal structures, you've done this, because you can draw bonds arbitrarily at whatever distance you want. And so in if you've used that, you probably know that you typically start with small numbers, right? You only search, for example, between two angstroms and three angstroms. Look for bonds. If you do that in sodium chloride here, what you will find is that you have six nearest neighbors in this first sort of shell. Your first nearest neighbors are these six, okay? But if you expand that shell and you look for bonds, what you find is this. Going from three to four angstroms, you find that you have your next nearest neighbors, which are of the same type, by the way, green bonded to green, right? And there's 12 of them. And if you expand it further out, there's eight other ones of the alternating type. And so this is how most, almost, Almost every single one of the, the current approaches for graph networks uses this sort of idea. They start with a position and they expand outwards and they collect up into a certain number of atoms, of, of edges. They collect the first 15, they collect the first 12, they collect the first 16, right? Something like that. And they create edges between all of them. But let me ask you this, like, does that make a lot of sense? Because in the real world, what bonds actually take place, right? Is it is this central green atom actually bonded to everything or is it just bonded to these six that are near to it i mean these other green ones are probably going to influence that bond a little bit and these ones to a lesser degree are going to influence it but we know that as you go further and further away bonding coulombic attraction falls off as one over r squared right so the further and further away you get does it really make sense to include all of those edges in the same way or are some edges going to be more important should the closer ones for example be more important or ones of an opposite type or ones of a different dipole that sort of analysis um, is not present in all of the graph neural network models. In fact, a lot of them ignore it entirely. They just connect everything. They put connections everywhere. So if you think about this in terms of a graph network drawing, it would look kind of like this. Like here I've got, what, seven different nodes, and I have fully connected this graph network. Every single one of these seven nodes is connected to all the other ones. So that would be an example of a fully connected network. Um, is that the right thing to do, though, right? Because think about, again, what happens in material. Think of the materials we saw in our last video when we talked about structural uh, features, right? We said that, you know, actually it's specific interactions that can drive properties in a slab structure. Maybe it's the lack of bonding, right? The open space. Or maybe it's certain types of bonds that give rise to things, right? Um, we saw that with the, with the presence of channels or not. We saw that with vacant space or these rattling atoms in cages. We saw it with linear chains of things that led to anisotropic properties. Just looking from my own research in recent uh, years, we discovered this new class of super hard materials. And then we found that one of them in particular was both super hard, meaning it had a hardness over a certain value, but it was also ductile, meaning it was actually relatively, it could, it could tolerate quite a bit of strain before fracture. And in trying to understand why on earth it was both super hard and ductile, what we realized is that it had everything to do with just these bonds in this direction, right? These gray uh, linear, you know, bonds of boron, boron bonded to one another, those were the key things that were driving this property. And you can read about it in our papers on how we figured out what was going on there. But that the point is, yeah, it wasn't all the bonds in this crystal structure. If I'd have done the regular approach and started with the, this one in the center and just sort of gone outwards, I would have drawn connections to everything. But in reality, what is really driving properties are very specific connections, very specific edges. So I think that's a big problem with the way that we do our current approach to graph neural networks is we just connect everything. And I don't think that's necessarily the right approach. So we ought to do something else. Maybe our graph ought to look something like this. This is what you would call a sparsely connected graph. Now, why is this better, right? You might be like, why not just connect everything? Don't neural networks and all that jazz just sort of learn what matters and not matters and they just learn to ignore things? True, they do. But you also lose information when you go to a fully connected network compared to a sparse one. And you're saying, well, what do you mean lose information? Well, think about it. Each one of these nodes now has unique and specific um, information when it, when it, in terms of how it's connected to everything else. But if everything's connected the same, then there's no uniqueness, right? There's no uniqueness. This is also faster because we're ignoring edges that don't matter, right? And so some of these current models that are just connecting everything, they're slow. They're really slow to train. They're, they're slow to work with. Um, and we don't have that problem if we do a sparsely connected network. Because think about um, 
you know, if you think about the different operations that take place with a graph neural network, again, more details later on neural networks and specific examples, but the idea is this. If everything's connected, you've got a, a node that's connected to all these ones around it, what happens is that there's an exchange of information between nodes. This can be via convolution, it can be via the attention mechanism, it can be through message passing, and more details on those later, but there's there's an interaction, there's a calculation that takes place. And if everything's calculating, then it's just gonna be slower, right? Now, what about the loss of information due to the loss of uniqueness? Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, <clears throat> maybe you're familiar with this. This is sort of a famous, weird pop you know, thing that's occurred over the years, but there's this idea of the six degrees of separation of Kemp and Bacon or something. So the concept, you know, as it says, like there's a board game that basically said like every actor is connected to every other actor within six degrees, right? Meaning if you look at what movies different actors co-star in, maybe Kevin Bacon starred with Meryl Streep in something, and then she starred with, you know, Michael Douglas in something. And so those two are connected by two steps to Kevin Bacon, right? Even though maybe Michael Douglas was never in a movie with Kevin Bacon, they're connected. So the idea is that Kevin Bacon, at least in the, the game, he must be a really important person because he's connecting everybody else. Now, this has actually been disproven sadly i'm sorry kevin bacon but he's actually not even in the top 500 of most connected actors instead you know who the number one most one is this is a tangent but it's christopher lee that's right saruman from lord of the rings he is the number one most connected actor but if you only pay attention to movies from the about the last 20 years it's people like samuel l jackson because he's been in everything Anyways, off on a tangent, but this th that's the idea here is that there are certain nodes which are certainly more connected than others, and if we just connect everything, then we lose that unique information, and maybe that unique information would be helpful for predicting properties or whatever else. So let's try and retain it, all right? So here's how it might look. There's different types of unique information. It's not just connectivity. Uh, connectivity is one of them, but there's a bunch of different what we call in graph theory, they call them centralities. Right? These different centralities um, can be measured in different ways. For example, you have your betweenness centrality. Take a look at this one at point H. Right, We would say that point H has a high betweenness centrality. What does that mean? Well, this is a way of detecting the amount of influence that a node has over the flow of information of the whole graph. So it's often used to find nodes that serve as a bridge from one part of a graph to another. This is from the wiki page, I think, that I'm finding this. Um, Makes sense, right? If you're going to pass information from this big section of the graph to this big section, you're going to pass through this node. Therefore, it has a high betweenness centrality. And there's a way to actually calculate that mathematically, right? There's another type of centrality. There's the closeness centrality. This one right here, for example. This is a way of detecting nodes that are able to spread information efficiently through a graph. So the closeness centrality of a node measures the average farness, so the inverse of distance, right? How far something is. Um, to all other nodes and nodes with a high closeness score will have average shorter distances to everything else right that's an example of another centrality that we would lose if we disconnect everything but there's um, the degree centrality like this one right here the degree centrality measures the number of incoming or outgoing relationships from a node so basically the more connected it is it has a higher degree centrality and then you can actually modify that you can say well it's not just a single node but rather maybe it's the nodes that it is connected to, let's take those into account. So they call that the eigenvector centrality. So the algorithm calculates here, it basically says, uh, it measures the transitive influence of nodes. The relationships originating from high scoring nodes contribute more to the score of a node uh, than connections from low scoring nodes. Anyways, there are many different ways of measuring unique connectivity and centrality in graph networks. And these could be useful for predicting materials properties, but they're not really being done right now. And like I said before, some people I think have approached this with the idea uh, from neural networks where you have something called uh, feature reduction. If you have a bunch of different features and not all of them matter, you can reduce them, right? And so there's different ways to do feature reduction, autoencoders, for example. Um, but you could also do something called dropout where you actually just like delete that, that feature randomly and figure out whether it mattered. Um, so there's kind of this idea like when it comes to edges, which one's the right thing to do? Should we just reduce their impact via feature reduction, or should we just drop them out, or what should we do, right? Um, and I think that the other problem with the current fleet of graph neural networks is that they're becoming pretty heavy. Maybe you've seen this episode of Simpsons where, you know, Homer's brother 
long lost brother or dad or whoever it was is like, hey, help me design this car. And Homer starts saying, well, add this and add this and add this, all these things. And next thing you know, you've got this vehicle, which is got all this nonsense that nobody needed or wanted. Um, and it's heavy, right? And we have neural networks right now that are really heavy. Just to put it in perspective, like some of these things out there, they're typically connected to the first, the, the nearest 12 atoms around each point, right? Then the bond distance between those two points, that 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 edge right there, it gets converted into a 41-dimensional uh, feature vector in some models. In others, it gets converted to a 9-dimensional or 16-dimensional. But now you've got that times 12. This is a huge number of things. So every cycle as you go about training this and you update the weights on those, it becomes slow. Really, really slow is the problem. And more on that whole process later. Okay? Um, so are simpler graphs better? And what sort of information ought to be included? Well, it depends. I think there's a lot of room for exploration here. But for the nodes, it certainly makes sense for those to be atoms, right? Maybe you want to limit the amount of information about each atom. Maybe quantum numbers, maybe ground state energy. Maybe you want to start including some of the things from the composition-based feature vector. But um, we could decide how much is enough and how much is just overkill. The edges are probably going to be bonds. But you probably want to think about which bonds and how do we decide which bonds to incorporate um, it, is it just based off of distance? That's probably not a good measure. You probably also need to consider the strength of the bonds based off the distance difference in the electronegativity, right? Um, and then there's the graph itself. How do we actually encode and keep track of these different centralities, the clustering coefficients, connectivity, motifs, and symmetry? What do I mean by those? Some, some of those things? Well, you've got your centralities, right? And your clustering coefficients. We already talked about centralities, but you also have clustering coefficients, which are algorithms of how connected these things are essentially as well. And then you have motifs. There's different network motifs possible when you connect graphs together. For example, you could have one node passing information to two other nodes only. It only sends information. You could have a node which is sort of, in some ways sort of the opposite. It doesn't just send it, but it can also receive from those same two nodes, right? Those are two different mode types that could exist, right? You could have a mode like this where node one sends information to node two, and that only sends information to node three. There's all these different types. There's actually 13 different types when you're talking about three nodes and two-way communication. If you go to four nodes or only two nodes or whatever else, um, then the number changes. But these sort of network motifs, they're called, are important. And you can quantify those and turn those into features. Um, now, what do you use for message passing an atom? What do you do about that? One way you could do it is you could think about What's the net dipole on a bond, right? Which atom has more of the electron charge closer to it, which is more electronegative? Like that could be a possible way to do it. But there's probably other ways. Maybe you could do it based off of size, or maybe you could do it based off of um, atomic number. Who knows, right? We A lot of these things are untried. They're unproven. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to explore how the much more m mature field of graph theory for graph connectivity could be applied towards materials research. Because right now, the, the models out there are pretty basic heavy, right? Um, and they, they're still great. So imagine if we fine tuned them or explored them further to add some of these other things or to explore whether or not all this is necessary. I think they could do even cooler things. And so future video, we will dive into some of these things and talk about how they tick. But for now, that's the idea behind them. Okay. In our next video, we're going to do a worked example of another structure featureization technique, which is two point spatial correlations or two point statistics. So stay tuned.